So this talk today is going to focus on the current international policy landscape and the ethics of human germline modification. So how many in this room here are familiar with the debate on human germline modification? Just a few. And within the Indian context specifically, you know, my two research assistants there are very familiar with it now, Bonnie and Sukhir. Okay, so I really I look forward to um, your discussion, the discussion at the end, and your, your comments as well. After my talk, uh, Bonnie and Sukhir will be giving brief presentations of their research as well, looking at this topic within the Indian context. And then after all together, I, I thought we could take questions um, as a whole at the very end. Okay, here's a little bit about CGS. Her mission is for responsible uses and effective social governments of human genetic and assisted reproductive technologies, particularly focusing on social justice, human rights, and the public interest. Okay, so human germline modification, what is it? It refers to the genetic modification of human eggs, sperm, or embryos. And in recent years, the development of a new tool called CRISPR-Cas9, short for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, quite a mouthful. Um, so CRISPR-Cas9 has allowed scientists to make changes to DNA faster, cheaper, and easier than ever before. And there has been an explosion in the number of researchers using this technique just in the past couple of years. And the coming years are sure to see more. So this is an issue that will really be at the forefront of law and technology studies. Right? And how to govern and, and develop policy in relation to this. So CRISPR itself is modeled on bacterial defense mechanisms. Bacteria defend themselves from attacks from viruses by stealing strips of the invading virus's DNA, which they then cut and insert into their own DNA so that in the future they can recognize when they encounter that virus again and cut it up with an enzyme called Cas9, so thereby protecting themselves against the future invasion by that same virus. In 2012, scientists turned CRISPR from a bacterial shield into a gene editing tool. It works by sending a modified guide RNA to search for and bond with the desired DNA sequence which previously would have been the virus's DNA sequence, right? And then using Cas9 as a type of molecular scissors to then cut the DNA at that particular point. And to repair damage, the, the DNA could then either repair itself, or scientists have then insert a, a different DNA sequence into that point as well. So by directing Cas9 to a particular sequence, scientists can cut and paste parts of the DNA sequence up to 20 bases long into the genome. This is now being done in a wide range of cells, from bacterial to animal to human, with widespread implications for the future of the world in many arenas, from medicine to agriculture to disease to climate change, among many others. And this cut and paste metaphor has led the technique to be called gene editing. Critique of this terminology notes that it is misleading by calling it editing as it gives the impression that the technique is easier and more accurate than it actually is. So in reality, the removal and or replacement of nuclear DNA sequences in living organisms is a biologically extreme procedure. And it is not as easy as cutting and pasting in word, okay? and, and in fact, it's quite error prone and full of problems. So among these problems is what are called off-target effects, which is where CRISPR-Cas9 makes edits in the wrong places with potentially very bad and negative consequences. So this, although this particular problem hasn't yet been solved, there's been a number of um, recent improvements right, in decreasing the number of off-target effects. So this could be possibly countered within the next few years. But the other main problem we have is that 98 to 99% of the human genome is composed of non-coding DNA, uh, which does something other than coding for proteins. And scientists yet have very, very minimal knowledge of non-coding DNA, um, nor of how it affects gene expression, and not to mention how many, how many genes interact with each other. So this means that even if the right gene were targeted and replaced, it could still have potentially disastrous consequences. And in, in contrast to the off-target effects mentioned above, this is a much longer-term problem, right, towards understanding the interactions between different 
genes, epigenetics, as well as societal and environmental effects upon DNA. And part of this as well is that there's really no free lunch, right? You see that some genes, if you change them, for example, um, to quote unquote solve one problem, another problem can arise, right? So if you have a lower risk of type 1 diabetes, for example, you could have a higher risk of Crohn's disease. So by changing a gene um, to be the non disease gene, it could just cause other problems. And there is a cross sex study in France of, I'm forgetting what exactly the disease was, but quote unquote curing children of a particular disease actually caused all of them to get leukemia instead. So there's very much to learn still about how intervening in the, in the human genome, what kind of effects that would have long term. 